How are we doing this morning? I tell you, this is the first time, and I'm vegan, that I've ever followed a fish flowing act. And I gotta say, their energy was really at the top tier. So um, one thing I wanna say before we get started here, and truly, there are 43 CIOs in this room, and I don't think the American people really appreciate what you've just done for them. Because shifting in the midst of a pandemic into a, a largely digital environment is a massive, a massive move. So thank you on behalf of the United States of America for what you did, truly. Okay, so we're here to talk about work songs. And right now we're gonna actually shut our eyes and we're gonna go back to 1959. It's a warm September day and we're gonna be walking alongside a man named Alan Lomax. So let's all shut our eyes right now. So what we're doing is we're walking into the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Alan Lomax is a musicologist. And what he saw is that Americans were losing many of the songs that made them who they were. He saw that songs that had been handed down from generation to generation were actually just fading away. And so he made it his life's mission to go and record those songs. And so in this day in 1959, where we're standing next to Alan Lomax, he's got a recorder. And he's going to record some of the prison songs of the Mississippi State Penitentiary. And this is what we heard. It's a song called Poe Lazarus. When you think about what this means to have a song like this, and we're standing there and we're watching these prisoners, by the way, you can open your eyes unless you're really truly bored, then you can fall asleep and I'll know. Um, when you think about what this means, these songs are actually pretty important. And by the way, has anybody ever heard that song before? There's a reason you've heard that song because it's actually pretty famous. And so what happened? Well, this is what happened. Alan Lomax recorded that song. He put it out on an LP series that largely went unnoticed by most Americans. That st stood there from 1960 all the way up until the year 2000 when a producer named T-Bone Burnett decided that he was gonna put it on the soundtrack for a movie called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That soundtrack actually went on to sell four million copies. And then when Anna Lomax had actually received a, a pretty significant royalty check and a Grammy nomination, she didn't think it was right that she should accept either one of those because she was not the musician. So she went back to the Mississippi State Penitentiary sort of records to try and figure out who was it that sang this. And she found a man named James Carter. And James Carter was still alive and he was living in Chicago. And so she flew out to see James and she told him, sir, I don't know if you remember, but when you were in the Mississippi State Penitentiary, you recorded a song with some of your friends. And when you recorded that song, you actually, you know, it came out on a record. He didn't know that. And she said, and actually right now it's just come out on a soundtrack and you're selling better than Michael Jackson. <laughs> and so he had to leave the room, roll a cigarette and he said, uh, you know what, you tell Michael, I'll slow down for him. So anyway, James went to the, uh, went to the Grammys and he got a, a royalty check for $100,000. He gave most of it to his church and he bought them a van. And what's interesting about this, the reason we talk about this is because that is a singular work song saved, just one. One work song saved, because if you look at the, the arc of human history, for as long as we've had language, we've actually had music for the work we do sea shanties that we would sing together when we were sailing on ships or field songs that people would sing in some of the most austere environments or industrial hymns that you would actually use to syncopate your rhythm. And when you look at what these songs actually did, it gave people much more than just a way to pass the time. It gave them an opportunity to not just find ways to coordinate their movements, but to also coordinate and build bonds with each other. It gave them an opportunity to shape meaning for the work they do. Because if you look at it, it's like H.P. Lovecraft said, once said, toil without song is like a weary journey without end. But what's interesting right now, how many of you in your offices sing songs today? <laughs> uh, we got one! We're, 
I really want to probe on this one, but I don't have time. But we're going to talk about what songs you're singing. Actually, no, I have to. What songs are you singing in your office? So you sing as a team? Is this a solo act or is this a team uh, venture? This is a solo. So we have a, a performer here, and I, I respect that. I think that's amazing. But what's interesting now, if you look at most workplaces, we actually let the music die. We don't sing songs in these workplaces. And so you might say, well, that's probably a good thing because none of us can actually really sing. But when you think about what we lost, I think we might have actually lost something really important. Let's just look at where we are today, right? Let's look at employees right now. 66% are disengaged from their work or their workplace. 66% are actively disengaged. You know what it means to be disengaged? That means I'm trying to find another job because I don't like this one. That means the majority of the American population right now does not like their job. Okay, we get into a, another statistic. 15% think leadership makes them excited about the future. Okay, you are leaders. Whether you're a CIO or whether you're in one of the partner organizations today, you in this room are leaders. And the unfortunate reality, and let's hope it's not true for you, is that only 15% of your people are really truly motivated by you. And then lastly, 22% think that leadership has a clear direction for the future. Okay, so that's pretty bleak. And I'm not here to say that we're gonna sing a song that's gonna fix it, but I do think there is something you can do to address this. Now let's look at organizations. Organizations right now are drowning in complexity. So there was a study by Atlassian which basically said that 50% of meeting time on average is actually wasted, 50%. And when you consider the fact that most people spend six to eight hours a day in meetings, that's a lot of time that we're wasting. There was a study by BCG that said that if you look at the sort of organizational complexity from the 1950s until today, we're actually 35 times more complex than we were before. And that's because we've instituted so many subcommittees, processes, reports that nobody reads in all of the minutia that can actually drown out our ability to function truly. And then lastly, 74% consider their organization complex or highly complex. So this is obviously square in your domain because so much of what people are experiencing, so much of the friction is actually related to the systems that we use, the processes, the processes that we institute. And this one I just had to throw in there because um, I used to work at the Pentagon, um, as uh, Tamara mentioned, and this truly spoke to me because the predecessor to the CIA had a field sabotage manual that we used in World War II and then we used it against the Soviets and, and still use parts of this today. And what I thought was so, so amazing is just, let's read a couple of these and see if they sound familiar. This is what we would use to undermine a government. This is what we would use to try and collapse an organization of an adversary. So we would say, okay, make speeches, talk as frequently as possible at great length, illustrate your points by long anecdotes and accounts of personal experiences. Never hesitate to make a few appropriate patriotic comments. When possible, refer all matters to committees for further study and consideration. Attempt to make committees as large as possible, never less than five. Bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Haggle over precise wordings of communications minutes and resolutions in my favorite. Refer back to matters decided upon at the last meeting and attempt to reopen the question of advisability of that decision. This is the CIA trying to collapse governments and it's the stuff we do every single day. And so, uh, and by the way, this is recently declassified so you can go and read the whole thing. It's really kind of ominous. Um, so what can we actually do? So we're in a situation right now, obviously, where you're dealing with a lot. To me, when I look at your situation, I think you're at one of the greatest inflection points of your function ever. Because now you've forced it that state governments have to pay attention to you. CIOs are now no longer sitting on the margins of these conversations. You are front and center. Who was the most important uh, other than the, the governor in the conversations that you've been having? You were. Because everybody looks to you to say, how can we make sure that government continues to operate? But at the same time that you're presented with this opportunity in history, you are also faced with the challenges that we just discussed. You have a workforce that is actively looking for other employment right now, especially technologists. 
and you have organizations that are collapsing under the weight of their own complexity. And I'm sure that state bureaucracies are not subject to many of the uh, ills that we've talked about. Of course not, why would they be? But what can we actually do? And this is the big thing for you. I actually think there's something that you can do and it's not gonna be to sing songs. Because if you ask the musicologists what was really powerful about those old work music, it wasn't the songs, it was the stories they contained. And so hear me now when I say this, the most powerful tool that you will need for the future is actually storytelling. It has nothing to do with technology, it's storytelling, because story has actually been the most powerful human invention. And when you look at what you wanna do, you actually have to influence people, you have to motivate people, you have to create meaning around this so that you can mobilize human action at scale. And so that's what we're here to talk about. And so naturally to do that, we have to start with a story. So this is a picture of the Al Sarawat mountain range. Is anybody familiar with that? We got, man, I tell you what, you are a very cultured audience. The Al Sarawat mountain range is not largely known usually ever, uh, but it's in Saudi Arabia. It's about a, a thousand mile uh, mountain range that extends all the way from the border with Jordan down to the border with Yemen. And for the majority of the Saudi Arabian kingdom's history, it actually divided that country into two. And so in the 1960s, there was a man named King Faisal and he wanted his legacy to be to actually unite the kingdom. Because what happened is on the other side of this mountain range here, you had the Red Sea and you had an entire population that lived over there. And then if you go to the other side, you had 50 miles of desert and then Mecca. And largely they operated as separate countries. And they thought well, if we could build a road over this, this would actually transform our, our country because it would actually open up global trade in a whole new way. And it would also unite our people. And so what did he do? Well, the good news is Saudi Arabia has and had then a lot of money. So basically they put out a blank check request and they said any international construction firm, surely you have the capabilities, come in, bid this job to build the road over the Al Sarawat um, mountain range and go ahead and you just tell us how long it's gonna take and how much it's gonna cost. We don't care. So of course, firms from all across the world flocked in. But when they got there, they actually realized that it's a pretty tricky project because this is solid granite right here. So that's really tough to blast through. And then they couldn't figure out in the 1960s how you could actually get the equipment from the base of the mountain range all the way to Mecca through the desert. And it, and it got pretty complicated. And so when people actually started to run the numbers, they just didn't think it was viable. So the king received no bids, no bids with a blank check request. So what happened? Well, there was a, a local group that was based out of Mecca and you know, they basically said, they went to the king and they said, we think we can build that road. We got a small team, we're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna find a way to make it happen. And the king had no confidence whatsoever, but he also had no other options. And so they told him, you know, it's a pretty modest budget and it'll take us two years. And he said, okay, yeah, guys, go for it. So what did they do? Well, the first challenge they had was how do we get all of the earth movers, the bulldozers and everything to the base of the mountain? That's 50 miles of desert. What are you gonna do? Well, what they did is they disassembled them and they put the, back, the parts on the backs of donkeys and camels and they walked a caravan 50 miles through the desert. And when they got to the base of the mountain, they reassembled it. And then they said, what's gonna be our road? Well, our road's actually gonna be the path that a goat walks because we know that goats will always find the path of least resistance. And so they followed a goat up and over the mountain range and they marked as they went. That would be their road. And then they lived on the side of that mountain for 16 months and systematically blasted and built, blasted and built, blasted and built until they had made the road over the, over the range. And then they said, okay, now all we have to do is build 50 miles of road back through that desert. How are we gonna do it? Well, we're gonna build it basically 100 yards at a time a hundred yards at a time, a hundred yards at a time. And in two years, what did they do? They actually built that road. It stands today as one of the uh, most amazing roads. And you can see it actually was um, certainly the, the path that a goat would walk, not what an engineer would create. <laughs> and they, and, it's, and it's a, it stands, it's beautiful. And so what did they do? And why and how did they do it? Well, what they did is something that no other firm would do because those other firms, what was the calculus and what was the motivation that they were thinking about? Global construction firms think in terms of risk and profit. The risk was too high and the profit was just questionable because they didn't know if they'd be able to finish that job. So it wasn't viable. 
But for these guys, what was, their, what was this about? This was a chance to be a part of the future of the kingdom, a chance to define and unite this country to forever shape the future of the economy because they knew the shop owners who were now gonna have access to global markets. They knew what that additional oil revenue and the ability to trade would do. And to be a part of something like that in your country's history, there is no opportunity greater and that's why you will be more innovative. You will do more interesting things and you will find ways to get things done that others wouldn't. And that's why, if you look at it, storytelling is actually the most powerful human invention. And you can go backwards and look at every great human invention and every great human creation and achievement. What do we know about it? It was created by human beings coming together and doing something that no one person could do alone. And the only way we've ever been able to mobilize that kind of collective action is actually on the back of story. And that's why I'm telling you today, if you can learn how to tell your people stories, whether it's the people who work for you or the people you work with, you can actually chart a path that would not have been possible otherwise. You can actually increase your influence to a place that you would not have thought possible. You can actually drive engagement and motivation so you can blow out all the survey numbers that you're supposed to be getting and have engagement that's way, way higher because you can create meaning and purpose just like those work songs did uh, before. So let's talk a little bit about why storytelling works here. Because it's easy to say stuff like storytelling is the most powerful human invention, but it's real science. And it's called narrative psychology. Okay, so brain science, what's going on here? Anybody read, I'm certain you all have, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, very popular. So if you've, if you've read that, you know uh, some of the science here. Basically, what he says is, when you communicate with basic language, descriptive language, so if you came in to a governor's office and said, here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna migrate our data to the cloud and we've got this transformation program and we're also gonna update our operating system and we think it's gonna be this much and uh, it's gonna take this long and, and we're feeling good about it. Well, the good news is that the governor will understand the words that you're saying. The bad news is you will only engage the neocortex part of their brain. And the neocortex serves an important function which basically translates words. But our memorability and our motivation and our influence of that part of our brain, not so good. But if you tell a story, you actually get engage a different part of the brain. It's called the limbic system. The limbic system is where trust and loyalty are born. So when you hear somebody and you connect with them because they're telling you a personal story or they're telling you about a journey that they're about to go on and what that means, you will engage that limbic system, which means that you're gonna be much more memorable, but you're also gonna drive trust and loyalty from them. So I implore you, and we'll talk about some of the tools that you can use to never communicate with just the facts. Find a way to construct a story so that you can actually access the parts of the brain that you need to access to get people to do what you'd like them to do. It sounds Machiavellian, but when you actually think about it, think about how you define your identity. This is a quote from Dr. John Holmes at the University of Waterloo. He says, storytelling isn't just how we construct our identities. Stories are our identities. And that sounds a little you know, abstract and philosophical, but think about it. How do you describe yourself? You might say, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old. I have two kids. I have a, you know, a wife or a husband. Well, guess what? Sounds like a story to me. And then you go, well, hang on, no, it's not that. That's not a story. I mean, I got a degree, and then I, I worked for the state of Maine. All the things that you would put together as your identity are actually just stories that you tell yourself. So when you can shape the stories you tell yourself, you actually shape who you are. And that applies to you as an individual and to the people around you. And that's why if you look at our, the two young men, I mean, the fish throwers, when they, you look at what they were actually doing, it looks like, oh, we're just calling back and forth and it's kind of fun for a tourist thing. No, 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 no. When you are actually using the, the rhythm and the music and musicality of those call and response things, what they're actually doing is creating something bigger than yourself. Because what did they tell you? They actually handed down that profession for generations. And they have a sense of meaning that's so much bigger than how many fish can we sell. And somebody on the outside might look at it and say, whatever, it's a fish market, who cares? But when they look at it, it's clear that that changed their lives. And so that's the sort of thing that you can be thinking about with the brain science of storytelling. And let's talk about how it works. Okay. Do we know who this is? 
Usually the, the government audiences do, because what I've always found is that, like me when I worked at the, the government and I was a former punk rock musician, there's all sorts of weirdos sprinkled throughout bureaucracies across America. And so you probably do know this. This is uh, a famous author, um, Kurt Vonnegut, um, who uh, has a tremendous story. If you actually don't know his personal story, I implore you to go read it. He was a POW in World War II. He came out um, and with the GI Bill. He went to the University of Chicago. And because of what he had seen in World War II, he got incredibly interested in anthropology. And so he went and he enrolled in a program that was actually a combined degree. So basically you go four years, you get your bachelor's, but then you add an extra year and you get your master's. But the thing is, you don't actually get your bachelor's degree until you get your master's. And so they kind of wrapped it up in one bundle. So here's Kurt Vonnegut, he goes through, he does all right. He gets through and he, he writes his thesis. He takes it to his thesis committee and, um, you know, normally by the time you get to the committee, that's a shoe in job because your, your advisors have kind of coached you and all this stuff. I don't know what they were doing to this poor man, but by the time he got to, to his committee, not so much. They rejected his thesis. They said, it's not anthropology. And he said, well, that seems weird. So they said, go forward, basically go back, redo something else and come back. He came back, you know, a few months later with basically the same thesis. And they said, nope, not for you. And he didn't get his degree. And what's interesting is now, of course, they've given him this degree multiple times over. After Cat's Cradle fully blew up, they were like, oh, well, here's their honorary PhD. And he was like, you know, um, so, but now, so he did it. But, but what was the central idea of that thesis? It actually ended up being pretty profound. And if you look at his, one of the quotes that he had right before he died, he said, this was my prettiest idea. So he actually thought this was the most important thing he ever did. And basically his thesis was this, all great stories have a similar shape. And this is incredibly useful for us because now we've got a bunch of technologists who might be more mechanically minded than most, but actually what I'm telling you, and I was a math guy, is that this can be your greatest asset. Because if you approach stories in the same way that a mathematician would approach life, uh, you can actually be in a pretty good spot. So we have an X, Y um, axis, and I stands for ill fortune, G stands for good fortune, and the X axis is time. And basically what Vonnegut said is that there are four elements to a story. A character in pursuit of a goal, facing a big challenge, and finding success. And so when you look at the actual shape of that story, you can go forward and you can chart every single movie, whether it's Cinderella or my favorite, Rocky IV, which I actually maintain ended the Cold War single-handedly because you had a situation where Rocky Balboa, he's up against the ropes and then he goes up against Ivan Drago and he has that big challenge right there because he is actually going up against Mother Russia. This person right now has been infused with every chemical known to man. He is a, a, just a beast um, that nobody thought he could, could really could, could really meet. And so then he's down here in the troughs. And when he's in the troughs, what's he doing? He's sitting in Siberia, walking through three feet of snow with a log on his shoulders. He's doing sit-ups from the rafters. He's struggling every bit of it. But what happens? Well, he gets into that arena and he goes multiple rounds and he eventually defeats Ivan Drago. And he says, if he can change and I can change, we can all change. And then boy, what happened? That wall came down just about a year later. So here we go. Thank you, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. But what's interesting is actually when you look at this, so scientists have actually gone back and said, okay, let's take this idea and evolve a little bit. And what they found is that there's really just six archetypes for a story, just six. And you can Google it, six archetypes of a story, and you'll realize that they've actually used AI to take the scripts and, um, and the manuscripts of major um, publications, and they've mapped those stories into those six. So that every major blockbuster, every major story, all the way from the New Testament, which also happens to coincide with Cinderella, if you look at the actual shape of that story, um, all the way, they've mapped them all. And so now you're in a situation where it's like, okay, so if the greatest stories ever told all have similar shapes, then all I have to do is look at the list of six and say, which one applies? And that's kind of what we're gonna do right now. So in some ways it's, it's time to write your song. Because as I said before, you are at an inflection point. And I hope you feel and realize the gravity of the situation you face, I'm sure you do. Because I know that the average tenure of a, of a CIO is, is anywhere from what, two to four years-ish. I saw some of the research on this. So you don't have a ton of time, 
but you have a tremendous potential for major impact. And this is really the time to do it. So how are you gonna do it? You just have to do four things. Okay, first one, start with why. We talked a little bit about this. This is the cynic idea, which is basically when you're communicating, whether it's to your people or the people you're trying to influence, think about why you're doing stuff. Create the meaning and not just the neocortex descriptive language. So you could say we're upgrading our operating system, migrating data to the cloud. And they would say, okay. And there's no understanding of what that means for most people. And um, you could also say something else, which is we're transforming the government or we're transforming the way that we engage this, this, the civic population, or we're totally revolutionizing how long it takes for people to do or get critical government services. Whatever that is, whatever your why is behind the major moves that you're trying to make, because there's probably only three or four big things you can do while you have those jobs, just make sure you communicate it in terms of that big picture. And what it, you'll find that it does, it'll actually stretch your thinking because when you start to do it, you actually realize how big some of this stuff is. And once you do that, you've tipped over because now all, all the people will follow you. Most people right now just want something bigger than themselves to work towards. And the one advantage you have, because you can't pay them what the private sector can pay them, the one advantage you have is that this is a public good. And so this is the time where you could rally people in a way that probably not many others could. Second one, listen for their story. Okay, so now this is a situation where you're like, okay, who am I trying to actually influence? What am I trying to do? Am I going into the governor's office? Am I going to the legislative branch trying to get money? Who am I trying to, to influence? And the first thing you need to do is figure out, well, what's their story? The beauty about Americans and really just people in general is that the, most of us see ourselves as the main character of our story, because we got a pretty good little sense of ego going on um, in general. And so that's usually a pretty easy question to answer. So you can usually figure out the first question here, who is their main character? Well, it's probably them or their team. Ideally, you'd have somebody who's really just, you know, oh, well, I'm in it for the public good. And so it's the citizens that are my number one. But unfortunately, that's not the way most of uh, politics works. Second is once you know what they're in it for, who their main character is, what's the goal they're pursuing? What is the end that they seek? If you're a legislator and you could be a part of a major data transformation, or you could be a part of modernizing government in, the, in a way that hasn't been done for 50 years, well, that might be interesting. I might get more sponsors for new legislation, or I might get more budget and give them the tools that they need to, to communicate that story. And then lastly, what challenge do they face? And if you just shift from me telling you the mechanics of what we're doing to us talking about the meaning of what we could do, it really does change everything. Okay, then we get into a situation, find the ending they don't see. All right, so now, those first three things, you've got a main character, you've got a challenge, and then you've got a situation where, what is the ending to this? They're having some challenge and struggle and this is where we'll look at um, 1962, Rice Stadium, September. All my stories seem to happen in September. I have no idea why. I'm certain you all know what happened in Rice Stadium in 1962. John F. Kennedy got up there and he basically said, this was the moonshot speech. This is when he said, within the next decade, we will actually build a rocket that takes people to the moon and they will step their feet on that and they will return safely back to Earth. And he was very prescriptive way more prescriptive than any of his speechwriters or people wanted him to be because that was a very unrealistic goal that he was going for. And a lot of people did not think it was possible. But for whatever reason, he just stuck to it because he thought that if I could put out there a goal that's so ambitious, so audacious, and so meaningful that we might just achieve it. And if we did, we might prove that the American experience was worth going for. And so that's exactly what he did. And in 1969, which was actually seven years after, not 10 years, we, we did do exactly that. We landed people on the moon and we returned them safely. And so what it takes as a leader is the, uh, the ability and the audaciousness to actually see the ending that your audience doesn't see. If it's your employees, what could it be? Well, we've all been through these sort of, I mean, I've seen some horrendous situations with legacy systems 
that, I mean, it's unbelievable. Some of the terminals that people are operating on in the private sector, like in insurance and financial services, but then certainly in the public sector, blew my mind. When I was at the Pentagon, I swear we still had a guy downstairs using punch cards because it was like, I don't know how to do it other than using the system and there's no way we've modernized it. And there was just all sorts of really arcane, unbelievable challenges that people faced. And rather than resign ourselves to the idea that nothing is possible and it takes years and these big data transformation initiatives or you know, legacy system wind downs are actually really tough and impossible, what if you called your shot? What if you called a shot that was actually much more ambitious than any CIO had ever done before? There's no reason you can't. And this is actually the time where you might actually have some horsepower behind you that you could get people believing you. And so if you call shots like that, you might actually see that you achieve them. And that could be transformative, not just for your people, but yourself. And every person on that team was now a part of something bigger than themselves. It wasn't, yeah, I worked for the state for five years. It was kind of a boring job. No, it's I transformed the way the government operates in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Lastly, tell a story that sticks. Okay, so now you've got your, you've got your main character. You've got the journey that they're, they're supposed to go on. You've got a little tension and struggle. And now you've got a vision for what success looks like. You actually have to find a way to construct that story that you can tell it and, and be compelling to the people that you're involved with. And for that, we have to talk about this man. Does anybody know who that is by chance? Yeah, Ohio, where are we at? Are we here today? Are you Ohio? That was a very sheepish. I am from Ohio, but I'm a vendor, so I'm not with the state of Ohio. Okay, well, I mean, vendors are people too, right? <laughs> In fact, vendors, <laughs> vendors pay for this thing, so thank you. Um, so, so just for you in Ohio, um, what we've got here, this is Chuck Taylor. Does everybody know the Chuck Taylor sneakers? Anybody ever had those? Okay, I got a question. Yes, they're wonderful. It's the most famous basketball shoe ever created. It is also the worst basketball shoe ever created. It has no arch support. It's not evolved since 1932. The design has literally been static the whole time. And yet they can sell over and over and over again. And the question is how? Well, it's actually because of this man right here. This is Chuck Taylor. So, so here's basically a guy who was using some of these skills to drive sales. And he said basically, okay, I've, I am, he was obsessed with Chuck Taylors. In, in high school, when he was growing up, he only wore Chuck Taylors. He was a brand man. And um, when he came out, they didn't have college teams or the NBA at that point in time. And so he went to play in, in these company leagues. So he started with the Firestone non-skids and that's the jersey right there. And, um, and he was a terrible basketball player. And so what happened is he was like Rudy Rudiger for our Indiana uh, people in Notre Dame. He was just like that, all heart, no skill. And so they didn't really want to get rid of him, but they certainly didn't want to put him on the court. But there was one game where they actually put him out there. And for some God unknown reason, he actually ended up with the ball. They were down by one point and it was like, he's at half court and everyone's like, oh, shoot. Chuck, shoot it, you know? And somehow he made this shot. He made a game-winning shot and he actually got put into the, the company newsletter. And so what did Chuck Taylor do? Well, he knew he was basically not gonna have a future in basketball. So he grabbed that newsletter and he went to Chicago and he went to the headquarters of the, his most favorite company, which was Converse. And he told them, I am a really great basketball player and I've just retired. In fact, here's one of many press clippings from my game-winning shots. And he said, and I think I could actually be the best salesman you've ever had. Well, here they are. They're like, well, whatever. What do we have to lose? So he loaded up a, his white Cadillac with a bunch of shoes, and he started living, essentially, on the road. And the way that Chuck Taylor did this was not to just say, I'm going to go find different stores to stock Converse, which was the traditional way of driving sales. What he said is, I'm gonna create something much bigger than that. So I'm gonna connect with the people who influence the people I want to buy sneakers. So he went and built relationships with every major high school and college eventually and professional coach that he could. And what was interesting is the version of, of Converse that he had sold these people was that this was the greatest basketball shoe and that it would transform their ability to perform because all he was doing is thinking about what does this coach care about? 
And he would find that and he would frame his story in terms of that. And so he just sold one after another after another until it got to the place that the worst basketball shoe in the world was actually the most famous. And so when everybody looks at the Chuck Taylor All-Star and sees that signature on the side, they think it's because it was the first celebrity endorsement for a tremendous pro player. But it was actually the first time that a company was going to let a salesman have the signature on the side because he had sold so many. He had transformed the way that company operates, and it, in fact, his legacy lives today. And the way he did that was by telling stories. And so I tell you this, whether you're trying to sell sneakers, which I hope none of you are, because that means we've taken a real turn uh, from where you are today, um, or whether you're trying to influence governors or you're trying to engage your people, there is a story that you can use to do it. And if you do, you will actually be in a position where you restore the musicality of the work we do. You restore the meaning and the intention behind what could be. And you make sure that you don't have your people languishing in the way that so many are in this country. And so with that, I thank you very much. And I have to tell you, uh, we were, um, there, there is a book called Work Songs um, that luckily the, our friends at NACIO have um, offered to provide all of you for free. Um, but uh, we haven't, uh, they haven't arrived yet. So they'll be here today. Um, and when they, when they do arrive, they'll be out there on a table. And I would just encourage you all to grab one and read many of these stories, but then also a little bit more about what happened um, with the uh, loss of music and the work we do. So thank you so much for having me today and wishing you all the best on your inflection point. Thank you.